I hope everyone had a good evening last night. Um, my name is Larry Epstein. I'm the current department head of Arts and Entertainment Enterprise. And I will follow up on Gene and Katie and Alan in welcoming you to Philadelphia and Drexel University. Um, let me dispense immediately with the gratuitous, it's always sunny in Philadelphia remark. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of like it never rains in Southern California. Sentences with the word never and always in them should always be viewed with skepticism. <laughs> they should always be viewed with skepticism. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm here to introduce uh, the Dean of the Antoinette Westfall College of Media Arts and Design, Alan Sabinson. Um, I did what we all do when we find out at the last minute we're making remarks. I got on the computer this morning and looked up Alan's bio, and it says nothing about anything he's done at Drexel. It's all about what he did before, so that was no help. Uh, but I know all of the things he's accomplished here at Drexel, and I wanted to share just some of them with you because Katie's only given me five minutes. Um, this building and the building next door, um, with, in the building where you've had, we've had our sessions, um, the Black Box Theater, the gallery, um, are all part of what Alan has brought in his 10 years, more than 10 years as dean of the college. Um, our MS degree in museum leadership, um, our online MS degree in arts administration, uh, our bachelor's in entertainment and arts management, and the continual reminder to the university of the importance of cultural leadership as part of Drexel's strengths and as part of the needs of our nation and our world uh, are all among the things that Alan has created, led, um, and uh, so really, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce my, one of my very favorite mentors, very favorite bosses, and no, I'm not buttering you up for my next, my next budget request. Uh, <laughs> Dean, Dean Allen Savinson. Good morning. Uh, it is an honor for us to host uh, AAAE for the second time during my tenure. Um, I will, deans are responsible, at least here at Drexel, for everything from the most minute to strategic vision and raising billions, so I apologize for the weather. Uh, <laughs> as a dean, I am, you wind me up, and I have to uh, speak a little bit about the college. I have five minutes, so I'll be very brief. Um, we're a bit unusual in that we combine all programs in design, all programs in media, all programs in arts and arts management under one roof. We are 17 undergraduate programs and we are eight graduate programs in those fields. Uh, we are nationally ranked in gaming, fashion, design and merchandising, product design as a design college. Um, you've gotten to see our beautiful urban center in this building, but we're our cinema and television, our TV station, our Mandel Theater, uh, our art and art history department, our photography program are elsewhere. Um, so we run a lot of enterprise, we work well with uh, the university as a whole, um, and we engage with the university whose strategic objective in part is to be the most civically engaged university in the country. Um, and uh, the university <coughs> has a urban extension center called the Dornsife Center, but several blocks from here. Um, and over there we teach seven dance classes a week, um, and we teach uh, music re re recording, um, we teach some theater to the community, it's an underserved community, um, we do a lot in the schools, um, and uh, we're very honored to have Jane Golden with us today, who is truly a leader and um, uh, uh, somebody who's done remarkable things in Philadelphia. Um, you know, I'm going to speak to Preach to the Converted. Um, we get uh, that the arts are a force for economic development, uh, they are a force for the improvement of lives, uh, they take a very difficult world and they bring some sanity and beauty to it, and it is a difficult world we live in. Um, and this is uh, what you do in teaching future arts administrators 
um, is incredibly critical at this time. You know all of the issues. Um, too many nonprofit organizations, decline in government support, decline in corporate sponsorship, um, audiences that are getting older, leadership that's getting older, um, and making having a healthy uh, and vibrant arts <coughs> community um, and all that it can do to a city or a neighborhood or a block uh, is just incredibly important. So uh, it's a pleasure to have you, and uh, I hope you're having a great stay, and uh, nice to meet you all. Just like class, where the stragglers come in. And <laughs> thank you, Dean Sabinson. Thank you for your hospitality. Thank you for the wonderful faculty that you have, who have been absolutely amazing in hosting this conference for us. It's really, truly a pleasure to be here at Drexel. Good morning, everyone. I, I continue to be Alan Salzenstein, president of the AAAE, but only for two days. Well, I'll continue to be Alan Salzenstein. <laughs> Maybe. Today we kick off two days of unfettered, unregulated, unconstrained intellectual enlightenment and hopefully some informal and good-natured fun as well. Many of you have already begun with pre-conference activities, visiting Independence Hall and the Liberty Bell, touring the magnificent Philadelphia Art Museum, attending workshops on publishing capstones and adjuncts. We were delighted and energized by our our welcome address by Kelly Lee, Philadelphia's Chief Cultural Officer, learning about this vibrant and exceptional city and how the arts are deeply integrated into the fabric of its life. And from some of the stories I've heard from the dine arounds, I'll just say what we say every year, what happens at AAAE <laughs> stays at AAAE. Um, and before I, I turn over the mic, I actually have some business to take care of. So I'd like to take a few minutes this morning to acknowledge and report on some of the advancements and the developments of this organization. Each year we've been enjoying record attendance at our conference, and this year is no exception. Inching towards 160 strong, we are close to double the attendance of a decade ago. This is testament to the strength of our field, your work that you do every day to enhance our industry, the compelling nature of our conference, and the need and desire for what our networks can accomplish. In years past, AAAE was often referred to as the best kept secret and a little known gem. And more recently, it's been heard at various meetings and conferences near and far, you guys are everywhere. <laughs> and in the spirit and perhaps as an example of our conference theme, Direct Connect, our presence can be felt in networks and conferences across this country and around the globe. We now have an ever-evolving mutually beneficial cooperation with our sister organization, NCAT, the European Network of Cultural Administration Training Centers. We continue to explore where our work intersects, identify global issues within our industry, <coughs> and we're in constant dialogue to address our shared goals. We now enjoy reciprocal benefits with our respective conferences, resources, and engaging in immersive study trips, having planned a previous one in New York City and one that overlaps and follows this conference in Boston. And it's not too late to join us. NCAT graciously hosted the AAAE board at their last conference in Lecce, Italy. And we look forward to the upcoming NCAT conference this fall in Valencia, Spain, with a study trip arranged for us in Barcelona. We're also pleased that the president of the NCAT board, Anique Strom, is with us for our conference, and she's going to share with you a glimpse into the NCAT priorities tomorrow during our <coughs> membership meeting, and I encourage you all to attend. Additionally, we're now in regular contact and have developed relationships with GIA, Grant Makers in the Arts, AFTA, Americans for the Arts, APAP, Association of Performing Arts Presenters, the Asia Pacific Network for Cultural Education and Research, ANSWER, the Taiwan Association of Cultural Policy Studies, and our close alliances with the Canada Association of Arts Administration Educators, and as I mentioned, NCAT, among many other acronyms. 
We continue to have presence at many of the primary conferences associated with cultural arts management, cultural policy, and related disciplines. You have presented at the Alliance for the Arts and Research Universities, A2RU, International Conference on Cultural Policy Research, ICCPR, Social Theory Policy in the Arts, STPNA, the European Sociological Association, ESA, and AMAC, the International Conference on Arts and Cultural Management. Again, among many more acronyms. It's virtually an alphabet soup of networking. This activity has put us on the map. Your individual networks have resulted in building our greater network, which is felt in all four corners of the world. We continue to enjoy a growing relationship with the Wallace Foundation, whose mission to support arts organizations as they develop and test innovative ideas to reach new audiences evolved from the convictions of its co-founder, Lila Wallace, that the arts belong to everyone. The Wallace Foundation efforts, which play a vital role in audience development and engagement, are the basis for an educational pedagogical initiative that we are fortunate to partner on. Many of us use the Wallace Foundation case studies as teaching materials, and now we are on the ground floor of expanding these materials into interactive resources that can be widely used for our collective purposes. Some of you came to this session directly from a moderated focus group for this initiative, and we look forward to additional member involvement as this project continues. Additionally, we have formally become a named communications partner with the Wallace Foundation, sharing their valuable work with you, our membership, and exploring methods and approaches for effective and creative circulation. You may wish to attend a session later today where you will hear about a recent series of student forums with Wallace grantees that were held across the country in Seattle, Chicago, and right here in Philadelphia. And this direct engagement between our students and Wallace grantees surpassed all expectations and sets the stage for additional future activities. In addition to these external collaborations, We've also been looking inward as well, building and strengthening our capacity and organizational structure. Much of what has occurred in the past few years is incremental but important growth as we embark on these new ventures and try to meet the needs of all of us. <clears throat> we have not only our first full-time staff, but as our first executive director in Katie Coy. That was pause for <laughs> We've been working to refine and adapt policies, streamline procedures, develop more complete and thorough financial reporting. We continue to review our bylaws and look to strengthen our board composition. We have added our first ex officio non-voting board positions, providing for ongoing participation for the immediate past president and from our sister group, NCAT, by having reciprocal board involvement. And initially for us, filled by our good friend and current president of NCAT, Anik. As you all know, we have changed our membership structure this past year from program to institutional membership. And this major shift in structure was certainly not taken lightly and involved an enormous amount of time, effort, member feedback, research, and creative thinking. This shift provides for more faculty to participate, to be informed, and to be current with the AAAE and our growing efforts. We have also continued to revisit and enhance our standards in curricular best practices, both graduate and undergraduate, involving a long list of field experts in various specialties and from practice and research internationally. And right now, about which you'll hear details tomorrow at our membership meeting, we're in the beginning stages of strategy discussions and looking ahead as we set the priorities for the coming years. All of these initiatives, these accomplishments, this growth could only be successful with a remarkable body of leaders, our board of directors. And AAAE is so fortunate that we can boast to having the best. And although I'll single them out again tomorrow, when discussing our growth and our initiatives, it would be grossly unfair to not acknowledge those who work tirelessly year round to govern and to roll up their sleeves to do the heavy lifting. So I'd like to introduce and thank our board of directors, and if you are in the room, please do stand so we can see you. From Eastern Michigan University, Susan Badger Booth.
That was a half stand. <laughs> From Shenandoah University, our treasurer, David Edel Edelman. From Drexel University, Julie Hawkins. <laughs> From Ryder University, Bria Heidelberg. <laughs> From Carnegie Mellon University, hey. Katherine Heidemann. <laughs> From American University, our Vice President, Sherburn Lachlan. From Seattle University, Kevin Mayfield. From Lemoyne College, our secretary, Travis Newton. From University of Wisconsin and Green Bay, Ellen Rosewall. And from University of Antwerp and NCAT, Anique Strom. University of Kentucky, Rachel Shane. From the Hong Kong Institute of Education, Sun Man Sang. And from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Sherry Wagner Henry. And I can honestly say that we are so, so fortunate to have this group lead the organization. Truly, they are hardworking, creative, passionate, committed, and truly a pleasure to work with, and the reason why AAAE has come as far as it has. Being in Philadelphia, since we feel the colonial history, last night I left you with a quote by George Washington. <laughs> this morning, from I think the same conversation, John Adams said, <laughs> I must study politics and war that my sons may have liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. My sons ought to study mathematics and philosophy in order to give their children the right to study painting, poetry, music, and architecture. With thanks to John Adams who envisioned our work and the value that we bring, I look forward to the next chapter of AAAE and I ask Julie Hawkins to come to the podium. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Julie Hawkins. I head up one of the graduate programs in arts administration here at Drexel. And I will just reiterate that we are so thrilled to have all of you here um, at our school and in our great city. So as you know, the theme of this year's conference is Direct Connect, A New Way Forward. And there is no Philadelphian who exemplifies this better than Jane Golden the founder and executive director of Philadelphia's Mural Arts Program. Initially hired by the city's recreation department in 1984 to do something about the city's increasing graffiti, Jane's efforts have resulted in thousands of works of public art, the nation's largest public art program, and a celebrated model for community development and restorative justice that's known across the country and around the globe. Jane Golden is a connector, a visionary, and as any city council member or mayor of Philadelphia will readily attest, a rather persistent force of nature who simply cannot be denied. Her career began by knocking on a grant maker's door in California, after the deadline, determined to get support for a community mural project in her neighborhood. She succeeded in getting that grant, of course, and she hasn't let any red tape stand in her way since. Jane's a fierce advocate for the arts and for the power they have to heal and transform <coughs> individuals and communities. She's very well recognized for her work, having won numerous awards and being well on the way to receiving what I think of as the academic version of an EGA. She has honorary PhDs from eight colleges and universities. She will receive another one from Drexel University at our commencement next weekend. <laughs> She holds an MFA from the Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers University and degrees in fine arts and political science from Stanford University. And I would like to state for the record that she has put all of that knowledge to use in her actual career. 
But what I appreciate the most about Jane and her accomplishments is that in the true spirit of great advocates and activists, none of that achievement or the work behind it is hers alone. Jane so perfectly embodies the theme of this conference because what she does over and over and over again is to connect and inspire all different kinds of people to work together for the betterment of themselves and the betterment of their communities. And she does this through the arts. At every possible opportunity, through every conceivable kind of challenge, Jane finds a way to say yes. And the results speak for themselves. The mural arts program is a visible, trusted presence in every neighborhood in Philadelphia. Its programs in arts education, restorative justice, and behavioral health serve tens of thousands of people each year. Mural arts is also at the forefront of examining what public art is and what it can be. Those of you who flew into Philadelphia saw one example of this in How Philly Moves, an 85,000 square foot mural that's installed on the parking decks of our international airport. It features the work of local photographer JJ Tizou, and it's pictures of Philadelphians dancing. <clears throat> If you take tomorrow's specially curated mural arts tour, hint, hint, um, you'll also get to see some of their other incredible projects here in the city. This morning, you're gonna hear some of Jane's story straight from the source, along with her thoughts about how and why this work is accomplished. And I hope that when you do, you will also come to understand why I and so many other Philadelphians am really proud to call her a colleague, a partner, and a friend. Please join me in giving a great AAAE welcome, we do this like no other organization I've ever seen, um, to our keynote speaker, Jane Golden. <laughs> Um, I have so much respect for Julie, so that's, it's totally mutual. <laughs> we have a round of applause for Julie. Yeah. <laughs> and we, thank you. Thank you. I, I, I love, I love the school. I love Drexel. I think what you all do is fantastic. So um, I'm, I'm really, really honored and humbled to be here today. So thank you. I start with much gratitude. So, um, okay. I'm just going to. Okay. okay, great. So, um, so what we're going to do today is I want to give you some history about our program. I want to show you examples of the work, and then I want to make sure to leave time for questions. Um, we're going to look today at how you can stretch art as far as you think it can go, and when you think you've gone far enough, you go further. Um, it's sort of a case study in uh, what started out as a small, scrappy, anti-graffiti network, a cleanup program essentially, and how through great partnerships, alliances, collaborations, and willpower, and the belief in the power of art to do something, things could change and it evolved into the mural arts program today. So as Julie said, so my history is, so I went to Stanford, you know, it's a double major, fine art, political science, and so I was an artist who thought I'd go to law school. So I'm like, so then, I know. So then I graduated and I moved to LA. I got to LA and I saw these glorious murals everywhere, but my painting professors, their voices were in my head. Don't, you know, don't do anything too interesting. Get a mundane job, get a studio and paint. Don't go to law school for sure. So I, I remember telling my parents all these things. I'm gonna get a studio, I'm getting a boring job, I'm gonna just paint. My parents are like, what? What are you doing? I'm like, I, I'm so, I have it under control, it's good. It's all exciting, it's very gonna be very creative. So um, I, I did, I, like, so I got a studio and I had a job, I hated this job, it was so boring. And, but when I drove around, I kept seeing these murals because my parents love murals. And when I grew up, I looked at pictures, these, they, my dad was always bringing home art books with pictures of Ben Shaw and Thomas R. Benton. So, and I was like, my paintings at Stanford were large. Like I, was, I, thought, I thought of myself as a social realist. So, but I was so miserable in my job. And one day I came home and I read about the LA mural program in the newspaper. And I'm like, oh my God, this sounds so exciting. And they said, they gave out grants to 10 artists every year. I'm like, ooh, that could be me. So I go home and I call them. I ask for information and they go, well, you're past the deadline. I go, well, what if I wasn't? So they told me, <laughs> right there, it's trouble, right? <laughs> Someone told me no yesterday. And I said to some staff, I said, I think someone told me no. <laughs> I can't take it. <laughs> I have to do something about that. Anyway, so, so then they said, so they told me what I should do. So I was like, okay. So then I uh, walked around Santa Monica, saw a great wall. 
And then I started to research the community, found there had been a pier at the end of the street, so I did a little design. And then I went down to the building with the Great Wall, and I knocked on the door, and this strange-looking guy answered. And he, like, there was a paper mache cow outside that said, love animals, don't eat them. I'm like, ooh, I'm a vegetarian, we'll bond. So <laughs> he goes, who are you? I said, my name is Jane Golden. Um, I'm, I'm new in town. I said, I I'm a graduate of Stanford University. Like, that would mean something, right? He goes, like, so? So I was like, well, um, I'd like to do a mural on your wall. He goes, okay. I said, oh, no, I'd really like to do He goes, I, I heard what you said. So I said, would you like to see samples of my artwork? He goes, not particularly. <laughs> I said, so I'm, you're going to let me, a stranger, paint a mural on your wall. He goes, that's right. So I said, well, he goes, you really should like stop talking. He goes, he goes, I think we've accomplished everything that needs to be done here. I said, oh, no, there's one more thing. I said, would you sign my piece of paper? And he goes, he goes what is this? I said, just, you, you're giving me permission. So he goes, all right. So he goes, I, Ronnie Bruce, give Jane Golden permission to paint a mural on my wall. I'm like, I can't believe it. So I, I go back, and I, I meet people in my neighborhood. They're just strangers. And I'm like, why are so many people in L.A.? Like, they seem to all be, like, sitting on their steps. But they, of course, were all between, like, acting and directing jobs. This is L.A., which is sort of exciting, right? Oh, you were on some TV show. Would you paint my mural with me? So they're like, sure. I'm like, everyone is so agreeable. So I call back the city of L.A., and I said, I've done everything you said would you reconsider an application from me? They said, no, you're past the deadline. Like, what don't you understand? I said, oh, okay, fine. So then I thought, mm, maybe what I'll do is drive downtown, drop off the application on the executive director's desk. So I do that. I, like, drive downtown. I drop it off. You know, I drop off this application. I go home, and I call them every day for three months. And like, finally, in December, I get a call, and I hear someone say, is this Jane Golden? I'm like, yes, it is. They said, we hope we never hear from you again. I'm like, who's this? They said, this is the LA mural program. You have the grant. It was like, the like you have that mural. <laughs> like a catch. So then I was like, oh, oh, the grant. Oh my God, I have it. It was like $300. <laughs> it's a giant ball, right? I'm like, I have $300. Oh. And they gave me like leftover paint. So I paint this mural, right? So. I, like, I'm excited, it's thrilling, I'm on this corner, and I feel like, oh my god, I'm having conversations with neighbors, and we're talking about politics and community concerns, and I'm like, this is what art is about, it's about making, like, beauty accessible to everyone, and, like, I thought about, like, theories of why murals were important, but I was testing it by being out there on that corner, but what's funny, a little funny little story, like, halfway in between this mural, like, there's an article about it in the LA Times, it was so exciting, and then the next day, this guy drives up in a, like, fancy car, He's in a suit, and he gets out, and he goes, are you Jane Golden? And I'm like, yes, I am. He said, I have something to ask you. I, I said, I said like, am I in trouble? <laughs> so he said, um, my name is, and he said his name. And I said, oh, hello. Like, I'm like waiting for the punchline here. And he goes, um, it's not familiar to you, is it? I, I go, no. He said, I own this building. So I'm like, so I look up the street at the, where the strange looking man is who signed my little piece of paper, and he goes, he's the tenant. <laughs> I'm like, oh right, there's a difference. <laughs> I'm like, then I said, do you like it? <laughs> pause, dramatic pause, <laughs> right? It's LA, it's a little dramatic drama every now and then. And so he said, I love it. Oh my God, thank God. <laughs> so then when it was finished, then people said, you have to dedicate it. I'm like, De that's great. So they said, get someone famous to dedicate it. I said, I'm like 22 from New Jersey. I don't know anybody famous. So they said, Jane Fonda lives up the street. So I went up the street, I knocked on her door, I'm totally <laughs> She answered. There's Jane Fonda. I'm like, oh, Jane Fonda. So I said, oh, hello, my name's Jane Golden. And, I'm, and I, she cut me off. She goes, I see you out there working, moving, scaffolding, carrying paint. I'd love to see young women at work. What can I do to help you? I said, you could cut the ribbon at the mural dedication. <laughs> she said, is there anything else I can do? And now I'm like, oh, my God, why didn't I ask for a donation? <laughs> I said, you could bring friends. <laughs> and she said, oh, I will. And she did. And it was this huge ded dedication. And it was overwhelming. And then I painted murals for like five years. And I worked with kids on probation. And I fell in love with mural painting. And then I became really, really sick. I have lupus. And I was like deathly ill and told I wouldn't live long. And it was startling and shocking to be confronted with your mortality. So I came back east. I grew up not far from here in Margate, New Jersey. And I used to come. And so I started to get better. But I would come every week to Hahnemann Hospital up here and I would go for treatments and I thought like you know we have to 
when you're like told you're not going to live long, but you're like, but you think you try, you're, you you want to be hopeful, and you know some nurses were giving me hope that I could overcome this, and but you have to be very tenacious, which seemed to, like I could do that. So, <laughs> and I know. Um, so I, you know, like my whole world turned upside down because I had a, fa- you know, I had like friends in LA and my work and I gave it all up and I just couldn't go back to LA because it was too scary having this chronic illness that they said there's no cure for it just goes in and out of remission if you're lucky so I said I'm gonna now stay on this coast so I wasn't sure what I'd do and then I was in the waiting room and I pick up the newspaper the Philadelphia Inquirer and I read an article about this new program Philly has a new mayor sort of a sense great sense of optimism first african-american mayor and a giant graffiti crisis and Wilson Good says in this article that he is going to come back graffiti. He said, I have, you know, I'm going to, I've made a campaign promise. I'm going to do it. We're creating an anti-graffiti network. We're going to work with the kids who are writing on walls. And it comes to my attention that a lot of the kids like art, and we're going to have an art component. I was like, that could be my job. <laughs> like, why in the world would I think that? But I did. So I go home <laughs> from the doctor, and I compose a letter. Dear Wilson Good, my name is Jane Golden. And I would love to work for the Anti-Graffiti Network. So here, please call me. <laughs> <laughs> my phone number is, I, I don't know. So I send a letter with my resume and some pictures of murals in LA. And two weeks later, I had gone out to the movies. I come back and my dad is very excited. And he goes, you won't believe who called. So I said, who? And he said, um, somebody called from the mayor's office in Philadelphia. I'm like, what? My letter. Someone read my letter. He goes, all his name's Oliver Franklin. He's the deputy city representative for arts and culture, and he wants to see you. He knows your work in L.A. I'm like, oh. So then the ne- I don't sleep at night. The next day I call Oliver Franklin. He says, come up for an interview. I go up for an interview. He said, look, I know the woman who gave you your first grant. and I know what you've done. I think you'd be perfect for the anti-graffiti network. Go see Tim Spencer. So I do. So there's Philly, eight, 1984. So I go see Tim Spencer. I walk into this office and it's like pandemonium, right? And there are like a ton of kids and they're like senior police officers. There's just commotion. And then I go and see Tim. Tim looks at my resume and he goes, okay, um, if you want to have the job, you can have it. The pay is $12,000 a year. There are going to be about 1,000 graffiti writers. And he sort of pauses, like sort of like good luck, right? (laughs) So then he goes, oh, and he said, you know, and he gave me a few other sort of things about the job, but not very much. And he said, oh, and you can have, here are your art supplies. He had a little box with magic markers and paper. <laughs> and like, wow, this is like, really like, this is diving in like the deep end. And so, um, I, and I walked, again, walked through the office following Tim to my art room, which I, I think had been a closet up until the day before. And I was like, I can't, I like, I really want this job. And I don't know why, because this seems like total, like chaos. It was just like, just commotion. And I thought, oh, all my life I've loved reading crime novels. Now I'm living in one. You know, it's like... <laughs> And there were graffiti writers everywhere. And people would say, what's in your, what's in your book bag? And people, they would say, books. And then you'd hear clicking noises. And then they would go out in the hall and you'd hear, Tss. I'm like, oh my god, are they writing on the walls of City Hall Annex? And they were, and the police would chase them. I'm like, all right, this is going to be great. And there's no roadmap, there's no blueprint. And I'm so evidently having like a 1,000 kids at my door soon. So, um, so anti-graffiti, how is it structured? There was a, you see why everyone looks so happy here? I love this picture. (laughs) They are signing an amnesty pledge where they're swearing they will never write on walls for the rest of their lives. Not true, but it's a beginning. And why I love anti-graffiti. And this, like, it sort of connects, I think, to the work that you do and why I, everywhere I go, I want people to be believers in the power of art. But it's also about the power of, of will, innovation, creativity, to make a change in our world. You know, Wilson Good could have said, you know what, I want to get rid of graffiti. Okay, Wilson Good, good idea. And I'm just going to paint it out. I'm going to do what every major city is doing across the country. But no, he said, I'm going to work with the kids who are writing on walls. I'm going to empower them to be change agents. And guess what? I'm going to pay them. And not only am I going to pay them, I'm going to support them because I feel they have real talent. It was very courageous back then. It would be courageous now because guess what? He took six million of dollars government funding and put it on the table and said, this is exactly what I'm going to do. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I have worked for a ton of public officials. And they can talk all they want about problems. Until they fund it and do something about it, it is white noise. It does not mean anything. And so I'm like, this guy's brave. 
So I was like loving this. So I'm like, okay. And I am like, like I'm going to do whatever he needs done. I was like, sign me up. So I love the fact that the seat of power was open to kids from every neighborhood of the city. Talk about sort of a shift, a paradigm shift in power dynamics. It was phenomenal. So, um, and Wilson Good had come to power at a time he followed another mayor, Frank Rizzo, who really had neglected communities of color. So it was like this, it, the timing was so, it was very exciting. And for me, it was a privilege to be part of the Good administration. So anyway, so um, I started to think about what could I do. So you do what you know, right? So I said, okay, this is what I want to do. We're going to have our programs. We're going to go into churches and community centers and rec centers. We're going to call the Philadelphia Museum of Art and see if they would have a program. And I would emphasize the word. I, I work with former graffiti writers, underline former. And then, and they were very agreeable. And then um, I said, and we're going to do murals. But then my boss said, you know what you need? You need an assistant. So here's my assistant. I just got an email from him. He was in the army and he won a medal. I mean, now he's getting his master's in social work. I'm so proud of him. Um, but back, back, back then, he was Tran, and he was uh, to, Tran was everywhere. Uh, graffiti writers uh, were uh, many of them were highly strategic and looked for good walls, like I do as a muralist. Um, so we had something in common. But um, I uh, said to Tran, "What I want to do is understand the graffiti world." I felt like an anthropologist, right? I felt like I can't do anything about the graffiti crisis unless I understand it. Why do kids write on walls? What are they doing? So he told me they're highly organized. They have graffiti gangs, the bomb, bombs, bombers. Um, they meet every Saturday at, in North Philly. They plan their routes. It was like they had a strategic plan. I was like, really? <laughs> Are they this organized? It seems crazy to me. But they were. And then if you were able to get to the big name graffiti writers, you could get to all the kids following them. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. So I'm like, just sign me up. I was so eager. Anything, everything. And then, um, so, and then <clears throat> Tran and I started to do some small murals in North Philadelphia. And then one evening, two weeks after I started working, Train. There's a knock at my door on Friday night. You knew where I lived because I would stop here to get art supplies because the city gave me like 20 gallons of beige paint and said, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I didn't this. I really didn't rush it. So I'm like, nice. Yes. Um, so I open the door and there are like 10 really tall guys. Like they just seem like they're done. They introduced me. They were telling me, baby rock, cool earl, disco duck, night, yes. I'm like, because I realized they're on the most wanted posters in our office. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but we did. We had them. And I'm just like, oh my god, what do I do? Call the police and like it. So I <laughs> Jane, 
because we only use spray paint. I'm like, oh, really? So <coughs> I like to write novels. I said, but that's not going to pay rent. How are you? You dropped out of high school. How are you going to propel yourself through life? Where are you going to be when you're 25? We're going to be like Keith Haring. He said, well, here's a wake-up call. Only a handful of artists make it in America every year who can rely on their, their work. Where are you going to be? And then they were honest. They said they'd be dead or in greater for prison. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, so let's change that. Let's change that narrative. And you help, you rewrite this. Okay, because a big city mayor has committed dollars to working with you. So we went back and forth. Eventually they agreed to take the pledge and there was like a lot of stop start. It wasn't smooth. They, they wrote their name after they signed up. They wrote my name, Cool Jane. They wrote everywhere. I was like, I offered you tea. It's clearly I'm not good at this. So, um, but eventually we had a cohort of young people who wanted to work with us. And that was absolutely thrilling and exciting. And so we started to do murals. We started to do murals where the only other visible city workers were the police, right? And people didn't believe in art. We went, we went around at first. People were like, who are you? They were excited about Wilson Good, but their neighborhoods have been neglected for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, right? <coughs> and people are not sure where you put art. And they were like, we want housing, we want jobs. And we would just say to people, what would you like? And eventually people said, you know what, the only visual stimulation we have in this neighborhood are billboards advertising alcohol and tobacco. No one asks us what we want. Things are done to us or not done, period. Mm -hmm. So we said, we're going to ask it again. What do you want? This is your neighborhood. This is not, this is not about art that is parachuting down from the sky. So a group of women in North Philly said, we went to Africa. We went to Mount Kilimanjaro. It was so inspiring. We want that in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so we did it. And if people said, we want Malcolm X, or we want Dr. King, or we grew up on a family farm in the South, and that's what we want on the wall, we did it. And the murals became a sign that things could change, that people cared, and that government could be effective. Because mm -hmm. when we went in and did this, people were like, oh my god, look at that. That's, that's, our, that was our idea. It wasn't our idea, right? We, we leave at 6 o'clock at night. So the murals became like beacons and catalysts of positive social change. And if you had met me back then, I would have said, no, they're pretty. But I wouldn't have said they were catalytic. I don't use that word lightly. But when this lot, this lot was filled with crack vials and syringes, and people said, we don't want to take it. And we're like, you're right. But it doesn't work if we do it. Like, that wasn't, people in this neighborhood were phenomenal and just didn't have any services or support. So together, we worked with Philadelphia Green. And then we said, okay, hey, what else, what else? And people start talking about city services and education. My former boss was always calling me up and saying, the streets commissioner said a group of artists reported the pothole needs to be fixed. Is that you? Created this, right? They didn't 
work on the bottom. They didn't work just cleaning the lot. You know, I mean, all too often, I think what happens is we, we sort of, the bar is so low, and we say, raise it, right? It's so important. So anyway, so then we flew through the 90s, and, you know, anti-graffiti was essentially a cleanup program with, a, with our engine, right? And, but I'd go two steps up, 10 steps back. In 1996, my former boss, Tim Spencer, passes away. And I said, you know what, I had it in the city. I'm done. I'm going to law school. <laughs> so, so I apply, I get in this law school. So it was like, it was shocking, and I was surprised, and I was excited. So I you know, talked to my brother one day, who's a lawyer, and he said, don't go to law school. I'm like, what? I took the LSAT, I applied, I did all those things. He said, no, 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 I don't think you really want to go to law school. I said, so, Jonathan, where do you think I want to do? He said, I think you'd like to run an art program for the city. So I said, but there isn't one. He said, well, start one. Go see Ed Rendell. Now, Ed Rendell had been our mayor. You know, he was our mayor, then he became a governor. He's been very, very well known. Anyway, so he was mayor then. So I go, and I go, okay, we'll go see Ed Rendell. So I go see Ed Rendell. I said, it would really be great if the city had an art program. So he said, so, and I gave him some thinking. And so he goes, well, that's interesting. I like that idea. So I'm like, what? I'm thinking, I can't believe it. So then um, he said, well, where would you like to be in the city? I said, uh, the, he opened a little chart. I said, the Department of Recreation. And I'd like to work for that guy, Mike Viridinus. He's now our managing director. He's like a big, well, you, you know people, like big vision people, very progressive, creative. So um, he said, okay, I'll talk to Mike, come back in a week. So I talked to Mike, you know, too, of course, I can resist. <laughs> I always jump it on. So then um, <laughs> I went to a number of people. I just can't help myself. I just get a motor that runs on high. So then um, I come back, and Edwin does says, okay, we're going to do it. Come up with a name for yourselves. So we said, the Mural Arts Program. He goes, Jingle, and you're in charge. I'm like, oh my god. But it's like, you're little, you have a spy club. And you're impressive. <laughs> 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 the same since our treasurer, and we have a budget of $10. <laughs> but the anti-graffiti had all been divided up, so our budget was teeny, right? So I'm like, ooh, we are a pro art program, right? I thought, this is fantastic. We are finally not anti-anything. So, um, but we have no money. So then I noticed the Recreation Commissioner was raising private money to open up swimming pools. I went to him, I said, can we do that? And he said, yes. Mike DeBiradinas gave us autonomy and support, and it's exactly what we needed, and we flew into action. And what we knew we wanted to do was open up our doors to all kids, not just graffiti writers, because too many kids in Philly just do not have access to art. That's what we wanted to do, A, middle school kids and teenagers, and design a really rigorous curriculum. Then we wanted to hire emerging and established artists, because we understand what the arts mean to our society. So we're like, okay, let's go. So there, Jackie Robinson, and then this beautiful mural, eight stories tall. And why this is so important and iconic is number one, it gives kids the dignity and respect they deserve. More importantly, it showed people that murals are the same quality as art you find in galleries and museums. And then we did the Peace Wall. Under terrible circumstances where all communication between blacks and whites had totally shut down, there'd been a murder, there'd been a beating, and people are like, you want to do a peace wall? You're the most naive person I've ever met. But we're like, no, we think this can work. And so I worked with a deputy mayor, Lillian Ray. She's African American, obviously I'm white, and we were a team. And we walked, we just walked around this neighborhood for a year asking people to trust art somehow. And I want to tell you something. When we did this mural, there was incredible support. People said, there's going to be violence, there's going to be vandalism. You know, we have a collection of just about 4,000 works of art in the city that we've created since 84. It's a giant collection. Now, it's, you know, it, it ebbs and flows because we lose some, but we're doing 100 projects a year. But, you know, the truth is very few have ever been defaced, ever. This would have been very easy to go up to that and write on it, but no one did, and the dedication was the most integrated event down there. I'm not saying that what we do is a cure-all for everything that affects cities, but I am telling you that there's something about art that has a catalytic role in the life of an urban center. And then we started to become more ambitious. We said, you know what? We are not just, we're not just thinking about walls. We want to think about the whole site. So we started working with community development corporations to reclaim space, to create a park, to do work that's really beautiful. Here in Mashua, reclaiming half a block that was just filled with trash that people said, oh, it's never going to change. But when people say that, it's like, no, of course it can change. This is about will and desire and creativity and something beautiful an image like this that sits in a pocket part. And so I'm going to give you now a little overview of mural arts. So art education. I think it's one of the city's best kept secrets. So we serve about 1,500 kids a year. <coughs> These are kids who are great kids, who attend schools, just have no opportunities. 
uh, in the arts. And then we work with kids who really fall through the cracks, kids in residential placement, detention, um, kids who suffered great trauma, uh, kids aging out of foster care. And we want to, you know, I think it's so important um, to really create the next generation of thought leaders. So this is serious project-based learning. And when you look at 21st century learning skills, what are they? Collaboration, teamwork, technology, leadership. So we want kids to make their mark on the city in big, bold, beautiful ways. Um, and in ways that are just where they're going to really feel good about themselves. So we have good stats, 92% going on to college, 100% graduating from high school, and a city like Philly, that's a huge thing, right? So, I mean, and you all know this because you're, you're involved in art, so you understand that and your peers are like the power of art, but you know there are these obstacles, right? It's like working with the school district. The school district is always changing. The school district is dramatically underfunded in a city like Philadelphia. So, like, I feel like, like everything that we're doing, it's sort of like we know all the time what our aspiration is, what our goals are, what we want to accomplish, and then there are these obstacles, and so it's like an art form to get there, but we know that we have to do it. So for us, you know, I wish I could tell you that we had 15,000 kids in our program, and that's what we aspire to. And then, so project-based learning, what does that mean? It means that we wrap up the of recycling trucks. <laughs> there they are. So the kids study single stream recycling. And then here we work with the famous poet, Sonia Sanchez. Piece is a haiku song. Here, this was painted in Juarez, Mexico, and this was painted in Philadelphia. We take on really serious issues around homelessness, and this is called Journey to Home. 60% um, of our kids when pulled face housing insecurity. And so we're like, look, let's let's change the narrative there as well. So we took over a storefront, we offered all these programs, and it it's like what we did in, in like, which for me, which was like the shining part of this, we moved kids from shelter to permanent housing. Mm -hmm. And then look at this, then we work during the school day where we bring together math teachers, science teachers, and we're the art teachers. And this is all about brain science. And then, I love this, remember, take your daily uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. And then here, this is Isaac Lynn, really great project with our middle school kids. And then restored spaces, too many schools in Philly look like prisons. Change that. So what do you do? You do art around the whole school about global climate change. And then you build an outside, um, here this was, a, we did our amphitheater in the back and all these benches here, all made out of recycled material created by the kids and it won a prize in the Venice Biennale for architecture. Restored spaces, our rec centers look bunker-like as well, so change that too. And then restorative justice, over two million people are incarcerated in this country. So what role can art play, right? Well, I think that we can play a significant role. You know, when it comes to our society's intractable problems, we should never discount the role of innovation and creativity to crack the code, because you know what? Our traditional interventions are going to fail us. And so we need to constantly be facile and think out of the box. So we have, we work in prisons, we work with people coming out of prison. And we have a very low recidivism rate. So, stat, I, well, I know I'm running out of time, so I want to get to some of these big points. So, this is uh, work we do with uh, crime victims and prisoners. We work in the state prison, which is the fifth largest state prison in the country, and we did a series called Healing Walls. We were able to bring together these groups that just loathed each other. They thought, they each felt like that group does not have the right to create art. This group, you know, why are they saying they have pain? We have more pain. They, we're all going like this. And yet, through the experience of creating, because we used to paint together at Greater for Prison, it's when people started to really talk to each other. It sort of leveled the playing field in a way that was interesting. You know, I always think our work shines a light on diversity, but it also lifts up our commonality in a way that's important. This is part of Healing Walls. This is about the impact of prison on families. There are QR codes in this, so you can hear the stories. And then our people, for people coming out of prison, we train them in building skills, landscaping, mural making, design, and technology. And I don't know about your cities, but in Philly, we have hundreds of small rec centers that are in need of help. And so we do major transformations, community gardens, and even museums like the Center for Art and Wood in Center City. Mm -hmm. We transform a recreation center like this is the Martin Luther King Center. Imagine this wall is gray and peeling. And then Porchlight, we use art to overcome the stigma of mental health issues. We have an evaluation from the Yale School of Medicine. We're happy to share it with anyone um, that looked at the impact both on individuals and on the community. And here, this gets turned into this. This was a methadone clinic. We took over the basement and turned it into an artist studio. People used to say to us, when I would make say visits there, I no longer feel like an addict. I feel like an artist. This is about suicide prevention, and we created a community of 1,000 people 
who support each other now. These projects, you know, there's a phrase now that's used everywhere in social practice. It's about crosses as, in, as important as the product. But I feel like we're like the original social practice owners because we've been doing it for so long and process is so important. So the journey to create this was noble and profound and deep and stirring. And the fact that people could actually paint together and for the first time talk about the suicide that had happened in their family because it was like a shadow in the corner. And our mental health commissioner is so awesome and wonderful. He said, we have a black box way of doing business. Let's break it open. And I'm like, I love this guy. I'll follow him anywhere. So this is, this is made of women who are homeless and their kids. It's made out of found objects because no one in life should be discarded. And then that's RISE, created by a thousand people in recovery. It's a beacon on North, North Broad Street. And we work with people coming from Burma, Bhutan, Nepal. We have a, new, a program as of five years ago called Southeast by Southeast. We take over hub spaces and we turn them into places that are full of life, where we offer everything from social services to cooking, sewing, dance, painting, hero making. And then public art and civic engagement. There, here we are in the parking garages. And here we worked with the head of the architecture department at MIT. This is a great artist out of New York who was from Philly, a graffiti writer. 52nd story walls you can only see from the L train. And then we wrapped color around 61 buildings in North Philly. Oh. This is about the impact of work on our lives. We brought over artists from Paris. We had a dinner for a thousand people, all about access to healthy food. We did uh, work with Katerina Grossa from Berlin, who did seven miles along the train corridor of color. It was to totally poetic. The growing mural. We <coughs> worked with ceramic, mosaic, and glass. New murals. We did it connected to the Pope's visit. He signed it. It was so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> and we painted the oval. We work on the ground. We also have, for, this is, uh, Neighborhood time change. We give artists. Uh, we work actually with with Julie, with Drexel, and with the People's Emergency Center, and we give artists like a stipend, a place to do their work, time to do their work, and then they do work that is socially um, in response to social issues in the community. So we're building communities of artists, and we employ 200 artists every year and contribute about three million dollars to the creative economy. Pay artists. Pay artists for that. And open source is really, this is 27 stories by JR. We had a big public art exhibition in the fall. Michelle Ortiz is all about deportation. Shepard Ferry, the sort of justice, he did a series about people who've been incarcerated that are doing great things to overcome the stigma, asking people, can we forgive? This is Momo, this is uh, 24 stories, yes. And so what can art do? So our work is about impacting individuals, communities, and by extension, there's a huge impact on the civic life of the city of Philadelphia. But what I want you to know is that through art, we can move the needle, we can create change. There's a saying that I absolutely love, and that saying is, hope is believing in spite of the evidence and watching the evidence change. Our challenge for all of us who do this work is to ask ourselves, what is it we believe in? And then to do our best to act on those beliefs, because the world that we create today is the one that we pass on and let it be a world filled with hope and justice, equity, and absolutely beauty. Thank you. Mostly city funds and a little bit of private funds. 
what I would say that I experienced back in the day when we were anti-graffiti is that the, the art people, the public art people, I mean, I don't think many people believed in us, right? Mm -hmm. They would say, well, you're doing, that is isn't murals. That's sort of like social work. And I'd be like, well, I think social work is a really noble profession, so I'll take it as a compliment, but I know that you didn't need it that way. So I would say <laughs> that people, people just didn't understand at all what we were doing. And then when we became, then when we started like going like, Shh, like we did Dodger J and this one and that one, then people were like, wow, look at, you know. So, uh, but I think the funders, it, you know, we're like a, someone, a funder once said to me, you are a deceptively complex program. So I think in the beginning, people just really weren't sure. But I would say, from early on, like we had a multi-pronged strategy, definitely, because we realized, you know what? I like the fit, the art. Of course, I'm an artist, the, but that physical residue of the the art that doesn't convey what if you go like that, what the real deal is, and that real deal is so profoundly moving and wonderful. Other questions? No. Budgie, obstacle city. You met your five mayors. <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that structure so I'm interested in comparing that? So some of you are city employees, some of you are part of the organizational yes. structure. So I would say we all are, the trick here is that we all are working for the mineral arts program, right? But it was very clear, and I don't know whether I could do this today. I feel like somehow we got in, somehow we were able to create a nonprofit but be part of city government, right? And so I feel we go under the radar, and I come up every once in a while and sort of, is this okay? Go back down. So I like technically have a boss, but like I introduced him to a group of people from mural arts yesterday as my supervisor, and he was like sort of startled. He was like, really? And I was like, oh, yeah, pussy, you're like my supervisor. So I was like, I'm like, good. It's like my husband was like, watch what you wish for. I'm like, I wish I had a supervisor. He goes, really? You wish I had a supervisor? No. Like, I mean, it would be terrible if I had a real supervisor. <laughs> So when we first became mural arts, we were with the recreation department. When a new mayor comes in, commissioners leave generally. I mean, every once in a while they stay, but but Mike DiBerardinas left. And then when he left, they were like, "Oh, you should go over to the managing director's office because then there was a colleague over there who was like, Shh, come over here." And she made us part of the division of social services, which was very smart because that put me at the table with commissioners who were big thinkers and had big budgets. Right? So suddenly, I, where, I, I, see, I saw myself, certainly then, is really low on the food chain. And I'm sitting with these really the Department of Behavioral Health, Department of Public Health, Department of Prisons, Department of Human Services, with the mandate from her that everyone should work together and with me, that art should be part of how big departments do business. Now, that is very, very innovative. I, mean, I don't even know if she knew explicitly how innovative it was. And that set us up for real success. To be, to have, we had our nonprofit, but to work with departments, so we embedded ourselves further into the city system. Because I very much identify as a city employee. All of mural arts, everyone should feel like a public servant responsible to taxpayers of the city, even if you're an employee of the advocates. So we try to sort of look at both the public and private side, and mind the benefits of both autonomy of the private side, to expand, to take risks, to circumvent bureaucracy, the public side, that we're working for the city and can do good work, and we have colleagues in departments, which means I'm in a, we're in a neighborhood, a house needs to be closed because it's dangerous, call LMI. This needs to be done, we know who to call in streets, we know who to call in housing, we know, you know, so we can sh sh deliver on a multitude of fronts. Yes? Okay, so my question is, and first of all, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Uh, I'm very interested in the way in which, you just mentioned the social services office. A way you're working, for example, with the prison community, who continues the work with the prisoners and the family uh, <coughs> after they're involved in the mural? What kind of programming, how sustainable is the engagement? Right. So okay. great, great question. So I'll say, so what we have, we have, so you come, you're identified to work with us. If you're in the guild program, it's for young people who are at a very high risk of killing or being killed. It's with Youth Violence Reduction Partnership. That's one street. The other stream are people coming out of the Philadelphia prison. So there's a cohort, there's several cohorts of people coming out of incarceration. They go through training and they work with us for about nine, 10 months. 
so they're getting a paycheck. We have a jobs developer on staff who works with them to get a job when they leave us. And then we have a mentoring program that works with them over the next year to two years to help them keep that job. Because the question you ask, look, this is tricky, complicated stuff, right? And you don't save everyone. I learned that back at Anti-Graffiti. But what you do is you try to set yourself up in a rigorous enough way to sort of guess, like, what could possibly go wrong? And I'm a huge believer in pathways. If you come into our program as a middle school kid, you can go into our high school program, and then you can go into our entrepreneurial program, our, our alumni group, or like 60% of our teaching artists, you, you started out as a kid. So we want people to stay with us long term. That's what we learned in anti-graffiti. And it's not brain surgery. I don't know, in our society, you always want to reinvent, right? It's like, oh, I have an idea. I'm like, really? No, no, it's all too familiar. Um, <laughs>
that'll be fairly easy to see. When we do coffee in the afternoon and break snacks, that's over here again. In the so don't miss the snacks. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll all be around today if we need further directions. Okay.